You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Greetings, Explorers. I'm one of your hosts, Johnny. Today, we're chatting with Ian Rosenberg and Mike Cavallero, the writer and artist of the graphic novel Free Speech Handbook. Published by First Second, Free Speech Handbook is part of the World Citizen Comics series of six graphic novels. Two of the other books in the series are What Unites Us by Dan Rather and Why the People by Becca Feathers. Free Speech Handbook and the rest of the World Citizen Comics are available now. Graphic Novel Explorers Club is available on all listening platforms, including YouTube. So be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to the podcast. That's right, Explorers. Today we are chatting with author Ian Rosenberg and artist Mike Cavallero. Ian is a media lawyer and teaches media law at Brooklyn College. Additionally, he is an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker and since 2003 has provided legal counsel for ABC News. Mike has worked in comics and animation since the early 90s. His body of work, to name just a few, includes the Eisner Award-nominated Parade with Fireworks, The Life of Time of Savior 28, Foiled and Curses Foiled Again, and the Nico Bravo series, a 2019 New York Public Library Best Books for Kids selection. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. And real quick, before we started recording, Ian, you had some uh, some uh, pretty good news about the book being reviewed. Uh, yeah, there's a really nice shout out in today's uh, Sunday New York Times book review in their uh, just published uh, graphic books uh, section. So that was a thrill. Yeah, that's big. See so your uh, your book in the New York Times. That's pretty big. So. It's awesome. A nice <laughs> way to start the morning. So um, real quick, I. I I'll say off the top, I love this book. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've read it twice now. Um, there's oh, things, thanks. yeah, yeah. I it's and and um, I was saying how my girlfriend should have been the co-host of this because she is a librarian. She started off um, as a children's li- librarian and then became a librarian with. Uh, we're here in Sacramento in the Sacramento Public Library System, and now she's a district librarian for a school district, and she was thoroughly blown away by the book like just completely impressed she said uh quote uh the flipping between the present and the past uh you could could be a barrier to get into schools but with it but you guys made it so easy the transition from the past and and relating it to the present uh one thing that really stood out to me was um the whole ordeal with the nfl and kneeling and and how you related that to 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 the past and the present i don't know it was just a very impressive book gentlemen thank you yeah yeah um what how how did you two pair up to to work on this uh well i've been wanting to write a a book about free speech that could be um a handbook and a a guide for people to understand uh their free speech rights because i felt like over the last few years, people are really clamoring, um, uh, people of all ages, uh, to know more about their free speech rights. And there really wasn't an accessible uh, way to learn about your rights uh, short of going to law school. So um, thankfully, uh, my idea made its way to uh, First Second, because um, they had just announced the World Citizen Comic Series. Uh, and, uh, and then Mike made a, a faithful email. Uh, yeah, I, um, I had already been looking for some, something I could use what I do as a cartoonist to, um, engage in the, you know, the conversation that was going on. You know, everyone we know felt affected by the 2016 election one way or the other. And, um, you know, I was no different and I, um, I had a lot of things I wanted to get off my chest and I, I felt that there had to be a better way than, um, you know, going crazy on social media and, you know, posting anger on social media. I, I just wanted to like most people. participate. In, like most, yeah, like everybody, you know, I, I mean, I get the urge, but it's, uh, yeah. it's, I didn't see how it would be productive. I, I knew it would just lead to more, more arguments. I don't want to engage like that. And, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to find some way where I could, um, you know, say, contribute something meaningful and, uh, World Citizen Comics was announced, and I, I wrote Mark Siegel, who I've already been working with for on a number of books uh, previously, and was just like, you know, this is awesome, congrats, 
and uh, I would love to uh, participate. And I think he had just gotten Ian's proposal, you know, so he was just like, I just got this, you know, and he, and he wrote me back immediately. And that, that was Ian's uh, outline. I was like, I'm in. And, and that was it. Yeah. Off to the races. The best blind oh, date yeah. set up ever. <laughs> <laughs> the creative blind date. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Not that it's focused on him, but Trump is in the book several times. And I, and I get that's largely because he didn't understand free speech. Is that, is that sort of. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, we wanted to begin um, each chapter with a contemporary question that this is, this is designed to not just be sort of a, a theoretical look at the history of the first amendment, but to really try and answer people's questions uh, about contemporary free speech issues. And inevitably, um, Trump, um, for good and ill, injected himself into a lot of free speech questions. Yeah. So whether it's Colin Kaepernick uh, taking a knee, which, you know, Trump uh, tried to make a culture war issue, um, or should students participate in the national school walkout, or could Trump stop Stormy Daniels from speaking on 60 Minutes? Uh, these are the contemporary questions um, that people have. And then we look back at free speech pioneers of the past who fought for similar rights all the way up to the Supreme Court. And we learn how um, what the court says about their rights defines our rights today. So it's really it's not a book about Trump. Um, yeah. And I think it still, you know, um, applies uh, to questions that people will have, um, you know, many administrations uh, beyond. But but it is. Um, but each chapter begins with a rip from the headlines question. And so uh, so he is definitely a part of it. And he certainly just uh, misunderstands contemporary libel law. Uh, so one of the <laughs> things he says is that the media can lie and get away with it. And that's the beginning of the chapter on libel that explains the true standard. Um, that is not the case from a case called Sullivan that involved uh, Dr. King and his uh, fellow civil rights advocates. Um, and uh, that gives us the standard that we have today, uh, a real vindication for the New York Times and for journalists everywhere. So that's how you will start with Trump, uh, but then uh, hear a hopefully really engaging story uh, about other more interesting people uh, <laughs> answering the questions about our rights today. Yeah, so so one of the things I found really shocking about the book is how fairly recent most of these cases are and and uh i don't know for lack of a better term but just like how suppressive a a a lot a lot of institutional like just institutionally suppression was happening and then especially like the first case that you mentioned in the book with that young woman who came to america yeah and um just try, basically just like an anti-war statement really is all she was trying to make her and her, the the people or friends or colleagues in her, you know, these. Fellow just, anarchists. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and um, what was really stood out to me was uh, how you, how you both illustrated and Mike and then Ian, how you documented how the difference between what they were saying in English and what they were saying in Yiddish and where Yiddish, it was almost more of a plea and maybe because their English wasn't as strong. I don't know. You know, it just, it was more of a statement and how they latched onto that. The, you know, the government and the state latched onto that and really punished these people horribly. And um, one person died in, in custody said it was pneumonia and the, 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 uh, the other anarchists, you know, said, no, they, they were, we were brutalized by the police and he died because of that. Um, how, how did you pick out these cases? Like, how did you go about f- pulling these? Do, are, are these things that struck a chord to you as, as, as you were learning the law or, or was it just stuff that you discovered through writing the book? Uh, well, it's a mix. You know, I, like I said, I really wanted each question, uh, each chapter to begin with a contemporary question that people um, have. So with chapter one, we talk about, uh, you know, is there a right to criticize the government, um, even up to the point of advocating for illegal action? Um, and that begins with Madonna at the Women's March, uh, somewhat yeah. joking that she had said that she 
thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. And then in the, the next breath, she says, but I know we must embrace love over hate. But that um, totally reminded me of uh, Mo Molly Steimer, the uh, young anarchist that you mentioned, a uh, new immigrant from Russia fleeing anti-Semitism uh, and the pogroms in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and she comes to this country and she becomes really radicalized. She's a seamstress right here on the Lower East Side. Uh, where I'm speaking from, um, and uh, becomes an anarchist, uh, supports uh, the Soviet uh, revolution, um, and you know really attacks um, in leaflets uh, the U.S. involvement um, in World War One vis-a-vis Russia. She throws these leaflets, as you say, in Yiddish and English from outside of uh, buildings and rooftops here on the Lower East Side, and she and her uh, friends are caught um, and imprisoned. Um, and uh, sent to jail for 15 years in her case and 20 years for the men uh, with her. Uh, and as you say, um, her conviction is upheld. It's only um, Justice Holmes, joined by his friend Justice Brandeis, uh, who have a dissent uh, that vindicates their rights and, and creates the idea of the marketplace of ideas, um, which sort of defines most of uh, free speech law in this country. And that is the beginning of um, free speech law in America. So it does not, a free speech law in America, despite um, the First Amendment being part of it for so long, really doesn't begin until 1920. Um, and so the book moves from 1920 to 2008 is the last case we do on social media. Uh, so yeah, we really wanted to uh, let people know how recent their free speech rights are um, and uh, to give some sense of the sweep. Um, and I'm interested in, in Mike maybe answering about how... Uh, how we illustrated differently the, uh, the Yiddish versus uh, the English, because that's a, that's a cool question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please, Mike. Well, you're talking about the, the leaflets themselves. You, you were yeah. a huge help in that, because I think I was getting <laughs> it all wrong. I know. Uh, you know, Ian was a, this isn't going to directly answer this question. This may be a, a rant, but uh, it, it really spoke to our collaboration because things like that, details, like that, how to portray those things, uh, those, you know, the answers to those questions kind of like threw the door open on the rest of our collaboration because those questions came up very early on. And, you know, I've, I've done a lot of collaboration over the years. Um, all of them are slightly different. Um, I like to collaborate, but, but a lot of times when, um, you know, once I start working, I'm, I'm fairly like autopilot. Like I, I know what I'm doing. I know what I have to do and I, I just kind of do it. Um, in this case, uh, you know, having to get those details right, uh, started Ian and I communicating a little more than I might on some other collaborations. And the more we collaborated, the more, uh, I saw greater value in, in you know, um, engaging with Ian more. And, and, you know, little by little as, as we worked, it, it just, it became almost like a, a daily kind of back and forth and strategizing about how, how best to portray things or, uh, what to leave in, what to leave out. Um, and it became a very close knit uh, collaboration. So, um, with the Molly Steimer chapter in general, um, I, j I really latched on to her. It's funny how you feel an affinity for, for someone. Who you know lived uh, almost 100 years ago, but uh, I really latched onto her. She felt very contemporary. She reminded me of uh, you know a lot of the punk rockers I grew up hanging out with uh, and meeting. You know, going to going to shows, uh, going to CBGB places like that. Like I felt like I knew her, and it really influenced the way I portrayed her, um, her expression. You know, there's certain uh, kind of gag moments in there. You know, she's wearing kind of like yeah. Engineer boots and one shot. So, you know, it all kind yeah, of. Yes, yeah. I was going to say the boots. That, the boots that. reminded me of a punk kid <laughs> when she has her boots up on I'm the sure table I had, at, I had at the hearing. <laughs> I, I had a few. Yeah, she, wears, yeah. she wears sunglasses in another moment, and, and Justice Holmes has a, an amazing American flag uh, tattoo. Yeah, uh, <laughs> tattoo. Um, but what's great about Mike's, um, you know, visual design for the whole book is that he mixes realism. Uh, all the people really do look um, basically like the, the real figures, um, yet, uh, and then adds in these details that um, are, you know, fantastical and, and awesome um, that I think uh, 
it reflects the sort of mix between the past and the present that we're trying to convey in this book. And, uh, and that these are really stories about real people, people that um, students and uh, adults today might feel like they know themselves. And, and answer to your question before, Johnny, you know, I didn't really know that much about the people behind their stories uh, until I started researching oh. them. But I realized, um, you know, as I, uh, you were saying, I'm a lawyer at ABC News and um, Nightline is one of the shows I work for. And they really have taught me a lot about how when you want to talk about serious issues, uh, it really needs to be character driven. Um, that's what engages people, and that's what people identify with. And so um, I think Mike's drawings make the the characters really uh, come alive in a way that uh, yeah. they wouldn't be just uh, just words on a page. Yeah, the 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 flow, Mike, of like how you tell the story that visually that Mike or that Ian wrote is 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 amazing. It it feels like a a blend mm -hmm. of like. Uh, the Cartoon History of the Universe by Larry Gonick. I, I, I used to read that all the time when I was a kid. And sort of Schoolhouse Rock. It just it just feels like this continuation of things. I, I You know, I'm 46. I was uh, a little kid when Schoolhouse Rock was really running, you know, quite a lot. Like every every Saturday morning, you you get these interstitions of Schoolhouse Rock. And it just, it feels like this, uh, like a, like you picked up the baton of showing kids in a digestible way of here's the, here's your country. Here's how to understand this important rule of uh, law in our country. And um, just beautifully done, Mike. I, I it's, it's one of the things I admire about the book as equally as Ian's writing. Thank you. We're a similar age. And I, I also grew up watching uh, the house rock and uh, it, it was a very, uh, it was on my mind as a very conscious, uh, influence, uh, you know, as I started to think about, like, well, what does this book look like? Um, it, it was one of those uh, signposts that sort of pointed me in a direction, uh, you know, at least as an early influence as to, you know, what, what the sort of visual language for this uh, was going to be, a, a way to take, uh, you know, a way to use metaphors, a, a way to, to uh, simplify the line art and, um, and, and present it in, in a way that, um, you know, who, the regular people who are, you know, not, not necessarily comics diehards, but, you know, regular people who would be interested in this book might, um, get and, and, and gravitate to, you know, if I, if, if I can, um, if I can keep uh, monologuing here. <laughs> yeah, please. In, in my, you know, what I have, a, I have one cardinal rule. Uh, that I think has kind of developed over the years of making comics. You know, like uh, if if you look at my comics, they, they all kind of look a little different. Like it, I I try to change the way a, a book looks uh, to to tailor to the story we're trying to tell, the type of story we're trying to deliver. Um, but but there's one thing in there that little by little has sort of developed, uh, and that I think is an overriding uh, approach of mine, uh, which came from uh, a Johnny Cash quote. Um, you know, early on, someone asked uh, Johnny Cash in an interview, um, why do you sing like that? Because his his phrasing and his singing voice, it's very plain. It's, it's just very simple and, and it just, it's just plain, right? And he was conscious of that. And he said, uh, I sing so that anyone can sing along. And I, I thought that was beautiful. and um, if there is a, a common ground in, in, in my different styles and the way I approach, I, I don't want, I don't want you to look at dazzling layouts. I don't, I don't want you to look at the, uh, mechanics of the page or anything. I want that to fall away and be invisible. I want to draw so that anyone can read along and that you're not wondering, oh, uh, what does that mean or, or where do we go next? Right? All that stuff should be invisible. Right. You don't wonder about the typeface when you're reading a book. You know, you're just, you're just taking in the information. And that, and that is my drive in, in making comics is, it's working with visual, visual motifs and visual languages that, that rather than have themselves on the back or draw attention to themselves, they disappear in front of you so that you can simply absorb the, the story. And, um, and that was the challenge here was to come up with a, a a, a line style and a visual language that would be unencumbered and just let 
Ian's narrative go. And, and just I, I've always said to him, like, when, when you have a great script, get out of the way. And, that, and you know, that's what I had here. And that was kind of my approach. Which is funny because Ian is in the book. Like, that's what reminded me of the cartoon history of the universe where the narrator of that comic will pop up to, to give you, you know, a, a quick end to this historical the history of civilization. And then Ian will pop up and talk about the case in the book. I loved it. It's, it's great. So. That was Mike's device uh, to get through a lot of, uh, a lot of copy uh, that couldn't necessarily be in the, the mouth of a character. Uh, yeah. And that's it, what uh, really astounded me. I was like, there must've been so much copy for this book. How, how long did it take you to, to, to from first, your first blind date meeting to, uh, to, to it being published. How long did that take? Well, Mike didn't get the script until uh, like a year after we signed the deal with First Second. Mm. Uh, and then how long from, from when you had it? About another year? And I have, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, finished it, I finished it a year ago. I was done a year ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I think... I think it took about a year um, uh, to get it submitted, and then you know about a year to uh, to get published, Copy which is very fast. Actually. Yeah, that's fast. Uh, I, yeah. I have we have a couple of friends who work in the com comics, and it, it one it took him about three years, four years to get his book published. Like from the time he was like, "Okay, it's going." Yeah, so from what we I were hear, actually that's reading it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ian, is it, and this is your first foray into comics. Am I am I correct there? It is, yeah. You set a high bar for yourself. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I've been a graphic novel fan um, for a long time, uh, starting like many people with uh, Arts Spiegelman's Mouse, and um, really in, in college that really opened my. I mean, I've been a comic book fan, um, particularly cartoons and uh, things like Doonesbury and Bloom County um, were really part of my childhood. Um, which, you know, maybe in retrospect, um, gave me an idea of how to mix political, um, yeah. with cartoons, but, yeah. um, but, uh, when I heard about, uh, when my agent asked me about, uh, the possibility of, would I be open to it being a graphic novel? I was like, that would be amazing. Is that yeah. possible? Um, uh, and then, uh, Mike, uh, and for a second made that all possible. So, uh, yeah, I, I would love to do more in uh, graphic novels and, uh, uh, Hopefully, uh, Mike and I are scheming to, to do another project. So that's nice. hopefully in the works. Yeah. Yeah. My, my girlfriend, again, a district librarian, said uh, there's lots of content that could lead in. That's her job, basically, is to find books for teachers to use in their educate, you know, in educating children. And she said there's lots of content that could lead into uh, world history, US history, civics. Um, so she's, yeah, big fan of the book, and and yeah, I am too. If if you're thinking of uh, someone in your life that <laughs> is very vocal about stuff and maybe doesn't quite grasp all of the nuances, this is definitely a book for them. Um, there was, uh, oh, let me find it in here. Yeah, we like to say that it's uh, for you know for all ages, but particularly you know, teens who want to speak their mind and change the world. Uh, yeah. So I think, I think those kind of uh, audiences will particularly uh, enjoy it. Well, like the thing that I was like, I knew this, but I didn't was when people scream about free speech, it's just if the government cannot step on your free speech, if you say something at work and it gets you fired, that's not, uh, it's, they're not, it's not, it's not affecting your, your free speech. That's You're right. That's one of the themes that the book tries to make clear is when there might be a First Amendment free speech violation, a constitutional violation, and when we're just talking about sort of free speech values or free speech interests. And and as you point out, uh, this is definitely something that the book, uh, Free Speech Handbook, tries to make clear is that uh, the First Amendment only prohibits government interference in our speech rights. So that can mean the federal government, that now can mean the state government, uh, it can mean school officials at public schools, uh, but that's pretty much it. And free spe freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequences, uh, yes, particularly, <laughs> yeah, particularly at work. Um, so you have very little free speech rights 
um, at work or in connection with your employer. Um, so while Colin Kaepernick, um, you know, we talk about how the NFL had a constitutional and a legal right um, to repress um, his freedom of expression, students engaging in that same exact um, taking a knee protest at a public school would be um, protected uh, against uh, school interference uh, or school punishment um, for them taking that very same action, because then you have uh, state uh, action um, and government involvement. So uh, it really does matter who is the one um, interfering with your speech rights. Um, and I think, you know, that's not just a, a small point. Um, I think, you know, I, like you, a lot of people sort of know that in some way, uh, but I think it hopefully really clarifies um, when you have a, a legal claim and a legal right to something, as opposed to just sort of when we're talking about a free speech interest area. Uh, and I think uh, Free Speech Handbook uh, provides a lot of sort of guideposts like that to help you navigate um, what can be a complex area of free speech law. In this country. Yeah, the key, the example that you use at the beginning of that with, um, you know, you can't yell fire in a theater unless there's really a fire going on and, and people misuse that example um where yeah the correct the correct expression everyone misuses it and and they really misuse it to restrict speech so whenever <laughs> anyone wants to restrict speech they begin with well i believe in free speech but you know you can't cry fire in a crowded theater and the real expression that comes from justice holmes is that you can't falsely cry uh fire in a crowded theater and cause a panic. So yeah. you need falsity and harm in order to begin considering whether you should restrict speech. That's not, those are sort of necessary, but not sufficient conditions. So meaning that's a start, but that's not even enough. So if your listeners uh, learn nothing else from this uh, uh, conversation and from Free Speech Handbook, I hope they will flaunt their knowledge and use that yes. expression directly from <laughs> now on. You can't falsely cry uh, fire in a crowded theater and cause a panic. Because of course, if you're crying fire and there is a fire, you're a hero. Yeah. And if you're if you're crying fire and the usher comes up to you and says, "No, that's just dry ice. Don't worry about it," and nobody cares, then that's also fine. <laughs> so, um, so the the metaphor uh, when used correctly um, is, is powerful, but when used incorrectly, it's often a a tool for uh, repressing the speech rights that we really do have. Yeah. No, it's uh, very beautifully and simply explained in this, uh, even for a knucklehead like me, I was like, Oh, okay. It's like, I, I'm an, I try to be an informed person. You know, I, 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 I read a lot. I listen to different news sources like Al Jazeera or NPR or KBIE news. You know, I try to, or, uh, that's our local station, PBS news. Sorry. Um, uh, you know, try, I try to stay informed and there's still so many things in this book. I was like, Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm so glad to hear that because they're really, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I've been a media lawyer for over 20 years. And when I began teaching uh, my media law class to communications grad students at, at Brooklyn College, uh, I was looking around for a book to, you know, um, be the assigned textbook. And, and, you know, there are case law books. But that's really only for law students. Um, and then there are a lot of books where people say, this is my view on the First Amendment, but they're not really explaining what the law is. They're just sort of jumping into what they want the law to be. Uh, and so there is really nothing else out there like this. And that's why I think um, people are, um, you know, hopefully so engaged and, and surprised about all the um, sort of cocktail party fun facts that, that they can uh, bring out of the book. It's because there, there's not a lot of other ways short of going to law school to get this information. So uh, I joke that uh, this book is not a, a beautiful tapestry that in law school you sometimes learn that. The law is like a seamless web. It's supposed to be this perfect tapestry where everything connects. And this book is more like a rug from Ikea. Uh, you get it <laughs> quick and cheap, and it gets the job uh, done. So yeah. it covers what you need to know. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Again, I, I can't sing enough praise for the book. It's it's amazing. I love it. I'm going to probably read it again. I know a few family members that will probably be getting this uh, as gifts for me. And um, yeah, just, yeah, thank you for, you know, reaching out to be on the podcast. I, I this was an amazing discovery. Thank you both very much for working on it. Uh, you've done an amazing job with this, with this graphic novel. Thank Thanks you. so much, Johnny. Really appreciate uh, being on the show. And if people want to uh, reach out to us or find out more about the book, they can go to freespeechhandbook.com. 
uh, they can contact me and Mike through the website and uh, see some of the uh, fantastic images that we've been talking about. Perfect. And where can they follow you if you want if they want to follow you on social media individually? Uh, Free Speech Handbook is on social media, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and uh, Facebook at, at Free Speech Book. And Mike, where can people follow your art? Best thing is to go to MikeCavallero.com and uh, you'll see links to my social media. It's kind of the hub. Go there and, and you'll find me. Perfect. Well, thank you both very much for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with uh, whatever you work on next. Thanks very much, thank Johnny. You. Pleasure.